So Nathan, it's great to have you uh, for the first time in person on Inside the Newsroom. And boy, there's, there's a heck of a lot to talk about. It's great to be with you, Josh. I really appreciate being able to join you inside the newsroom. And it's a very picturesque newsroom that you have. This is the home office today <laughs> uh, here, here in Jewish Insider uh, headquarters in, in Washington. Um, by the way, just for everyone on the call, uh, let, if you have any questions, this is an interactive program. So you can kind of click on your Q&A button at the bottom and ask a question. I will get to, to the questions uh, at the back end of the program. So feel free to send questions in for, for Nathan throughout the program, and I will try to get to as many of them as I can at the end. So, boy, where do we start? Um, you know, I wanted to start out just big picture. Um, I mean, you've been literally like meeting with top administration officials on, on the uh, issue of anti-Semitism and, and the, increasingly in the last week, uh, the issue of the Biden policy towards Israel, and namely the uh, threat to condition aid if Israel goes into Rafah to take out Hamas there. Uh, has come up. What do you, you know, this is, I, I sometimes feel myself, and we cover this on a daily basis, there's sort of a bipolar element to the Biden administration. You know, one day you have a very well received speech at the Holocaust Museum uh, talking about the evils of Hamas, talking about the uh, urgency in fighting anti Semitism, unequivocally condemning it without any ifs, ands, or buts. And then the next day you have this interview where, you know, Biden essentially threatens, or at least threatens to put conditions on Israel if it tries to finish the job against the, the organization that Biden compared to, to, to the Nazis in his speech the day before. So I'm curious, like, what, what is your assessment? When you, you deal with many of the top administration officials on a regular basis, what, what is your assessment of where the Biden administration is, both on anti-Semitism and on Israel? Um, I think that's the question on, like, every American Jew or every pro-Israel person in America's mind these days. Um, I think I think you are right in uh, I don't know if you're uh, clinically correct in your use of the word bipolar, but um, there's definitely a, a a split personality element to it. But I want to uh, go back and then and then fast forward, if I may. You know, I I was at the White House um, literally days after October seventh um, for a previously scheduled meeting, but but one that took place you know, again, just days after that the president came and spoke to. And at that meeting, um, he was already saying, on the one hand, Hamas is evil. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. We're going to 100 percent back Israel, you know, uh, in its war against Hamas. And he also said all the way back then uh, they have to be smart about how they do it. They have to do it in abidance with international law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, fast forward to yesterday, uh, right in the midst of this whole, uh, storm over, uh, what you, what you, uh, referenced the president's comments about, you know, they've held up one shipment and they might not send other weapons of a particular kind. And the president's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan went to the white house briefing room, uh, to lay out, he literally laid out 10, I want to give you 10 bullet points to give you what he was saying was the comprehensive picture and understanding of how this administration is thinking about and approaching this issue. And for those of your readers or viewers who have not yet seen that, I would actually say it's worth the time to go watch uh, the clip from yesterday's press briefing. Um, and, and, and I think that, um, you know, and, and, and at that briefing yesterday, like Jake Sullivan said, we do not believe Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, right? And then he also, in the next bullet point or the bullet point after that said, um, Israel does have a unique burden um, to conduct this war in a way that is careful about civilians and collateral damage and so on and so forth. Um, and I think they've been trying to hold these, I'm not trying to be an apologist for them, but I think my point is they put out these twin poles right at the beginning and that's where they are now. And we can go through, like, was any individual decision the right decision or not? But I think they've been torn between these two things this whole time. Um, I don't think anybody doubts the fact that Joe Biden personally, right, loves Israel, views himself as, like, he, he, he gets up and says, I am a Zionist, right? Which, if he did that in the middle of Columbia University's campus, would get him, like, think people would be throwing things at him from, you know, the anti-Israel protesters. 
So we, we should, that sh- shouldn't be lost on us um, that, that he's staked out that position. Um, but they're also trying to push this other piece of it. And, and I think as Jewish Insider has reported on over, over the past months, you know, there are competing factions in the White House and at the State Department and elsewhere in the government um, that have very different views. And um, not every decision gets to the desk in the Oval Office, right? So when somebody at the State Department or somebody even on the national security staff in the White House is handling this issue and doing something about it, they might be more tilted to the one side than the other. And that's how you get this uh, whiplash <laughs> effect. Um, and, and for those of us who are obviously partisans for Israel, um, we'd like it to all come down on one side and less so on the other. Well, do you, I mean, this is a debate I hear from a lot of folks who are also in the meetings and have these same conversations. I mean, is it a product, the, the, you know, the pod was reading the, the, the Sullivan, uh, briefing just as before he came on and, and it, it does feel like there's a lot of contradictory elements to it. On one hand, Hamas is horrible. They need to be defeated. On the other hand, well, we don't want you to go into Rafa where the last four battalions of Hamas are located, and it's going to be disastrous. And it's actually, I mean, how much of this do you think is a sort of a reflection to your point of bureaucratic compromise? How much of this is about politics uh, that you, you know, Michigan, big swing state, there are different uh, political imperatives to winning some of those battlegrounds? And, and hell, Pennsylvania is a, a state that has a huge uh, you know, pro-Israel presence, and, and you right, try right. to balance the, the politics in the, in the swing states rather than kind of have a clear-eyed uh, statement of, of, of policy right. and, and the need to defeat Hamas. Yeah, so, you know, you, even at the risk of sounding naive, even though I've been around D.C. for more than 25 years, I actually believe, based on my conversations, that uh, it is not politics that is primarily, certainly not primarily, but I don't think p- politics is the biggest driver of what's going on here. Again, because as I said, I think they staked out this somewhat contradictory position right at the outset, um, when nobody contemplated this war lasting for more than half a year. Um, and I think that, um, you know, again, there might be an individual moment where the 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 anti-Israel or the pro-Palestinian voices are sort of louder, and then you have other moments where the pro-Israel community is louder. Um, but I don't think, uh, based on my conversations, that that is the primary driver. I do think that, again, there are poli- there are senior officials in the administration who have very divergent views about where you know, how, how the responsibility that Israel has should be carried out. Um, there are people that try to, you know, um, navigate that balance. I mean, again, John Kirby, I think within the past few days, came out and said, again, we're not against Israel going into Rafa, full stop, right? It's about how do they go into Rafa. Um, and that's how they're trying to balance this. Um, but, uh, I th- and, and I think also, by the way, we should not, uh, we should not overlook, you know, obviously the huge role that Israel's government and its decisions play in this whole dynamic, right? These are not decisions that are only being made unilaterally by the president and his team, right? They are responding to decisions and what they're hearing from Israel. Um, and and part of the dynamic here is is what does Prime Minister Netanyahu and his team choose to say and choose to do and choose to push and choose to leak to the press, which I know you and the press love, but, you know, that's that's a big part of what's going on here, too. Well, I'm curious. I mean, there's some debate, in, especially in foreign policy circles, of like what Netanyahu, how he's dealing with his own coalition and how how significant Rafa really is. Uh, right. You know, some people have argued that, you know, that, that it's to keep his own coalition together and, and maybe there are other ways militarily that Hamas could be defeated. Or what would you have a... As far as the OU's perspective is, 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 do you share the same uh, significance and in, in the need to go into Rafa and the need to essentially take out those battalions, or, or do you do you think there's going to be some middle ground? Uh, that I mean, the, kind of- the, the Orthodox Union is many things, but one thing we are not are military experts. I mean, I, so 
I, I don't think we have a view on the tactics. I think we, I, I think most people in Israel and most, uh, I would say, sensible people uh, in the United States and elsewhere um, agree with the goal that Hamas needs to be eliminated as a threat to Israel in the aftermath of what they did on 10-7. And whatever you think the future for Israel and the region is after this war is over, it obviously cannot involve Hamas remaining as a threat. You know, how do you successfully achieve that elimination of Hamas? Does that mean, you know, surgical strikes? Does it mean a, you know, a broad invasion? Like, what, what how exactly you, that tactical question? I, 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 I don't know, and uh, the OU... So you just to be clear, you, you the notion of what Biden said on was it Thursday of last week, essentially threatening to condition offensive weapons if Israel does go into Rafa. That that is a red line for you guys, at, at, and, and, and for, for for. I mean, for it's you. a red line. It's a red line for us if that can if that statement, which is not clear to me, if that statement was you absolutely cannot do anything in Rafa then that would be very worrisome because that means you're letting all the Hamas people who are in Rafa off the hook, right? But in that same interview, when Aaron Burnett followed up and said, wait a second, Israel is operating in Rafa, which they had started to do, Biden said, oh, no, 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 they're not really in Rafa. They're just kind of on the edge, right? So even he in that same interview sort of sort of showed, like, I, I think what he meant, and I think Kirby, again, clarified this afterwards, what he was talking about was, like a, a a a a large major you know overwhelming invasion as opposed to some kind of more targeted approach. Um, again, from from I would just say from the perspective of the OU, and I I I think this is true. Like the issue is, can you achieve the goal? The goal is get the Hamas battalions that are in Rafa. I think we should be you know agnostic on what are the tactics as long as you can successfully achieve the goal. I've been hearing from a lot of uh, individuals, friends, mm -hmm. colleagues, people who are involved in Jewish communal life uh, of all stripes, who have sort of said something along these lines the last couple of weeks. That this this is the final straw, right? This is this is I'm, this is they they really and these are Biden voters or they lean Democratic, but they've become extremely frustrated politically uh, over the kind of what I call the bipolar element, but just sort of the the threats, the conditioning, the fact that you know one thing that comes up frequently is that there's not as much pressure on Hamas. It seems to be constant pressure on Israel from the from the White House. Um, what, as far as the Orthodox Jewish community goes, what, what, what have things shifted politically? What what is if you had to give a kind of a broad assessment of where the community is? How, how has it shifted since October seventh? And is there is there that kind of sentiment um, has it been growing uh, within the Orthodox Jewish community over these last few weeks? Oh, it's certainly been growing. Look, I I, I recall again in the days and weeks immediately after October seventh. Uh, any number of people said to me or emailed me or texted me basically saying, I voted for Donald Trump. I did not vote for Joe Biden, but boy, am I really impressed or boy, am I really appreciative of where, you know, how much Joe Biden has, you know, stood by Israel in the early days and weeks of the aftermath of the October 7th attack. Um, and, and yes, that is certainly, I mean, it's gone up and down. Um, and I certainly, it's certainly the case over over the last few weeks that lots and lots of people are very upset. Um, um, and and I would say, and we at the OU organizationally have expressed publicly that concern as well. Um, and, uh, and 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 it is and it is very worrisome. And we are we are advocating. Uh, just just to be clear, I mean, I was trying to you know give contextualized, uh, broad, you know. I hope uh, informed answers to your questions in the first part of this conversation. Organizationally, uh, I and, and, and all of us at the OU are advocating very strongly to the administration to, in every you know meeting that we are in with senior officials and not senior officials that we need them to stick with you know uh, stick with Israel as and and we point to the statements that the president has made and the actions that he took that back that up. Um, but and, and I want to also underscore, you know, just yesterday, um, there's another dimension of this that we haven't touched on yet, which is how what's going on in the in the war and how what's going on in the Biden administration's rhetoric about the war um, relates to the surge of anti-Semitism here in the United States. 
just yesterday, again, as reported by the uh, Cracker Jack reporters at Jewish Insider, a number of us met at the White House with senior officials. The main focus of the meeting was about anti-Semitism and combating anti-Semitism in the United States. But because of what's going on, um, the Deputy National Security Advisor, John Feiner, came into the meeting to talk about the state of affairs there. Um, and has now been publicly reported, uh, um, my, my, what I raised with Deputy Security Advisor Feiner was, when we're here sitting together talking about combating anti-Semitism in the United States, you've told, actually we were sitting in the room when Jake Sullivan did his briefing, so he told us about the 10 points. I looked quickly on my phone and I saw the headline was uh, that, that Sullivan had said, we don't believe Israel's committing genocide. Um, and I said to Mr. Feiner, I said, it's remarkable. The National Security Advisor to the President had to go to the White House podium to make a statement to the world that Israel is not committing genocide. And why did he have to do that? Because three days ago, the State Department put out a report that got tons of coverage that said it's reasonable to assess that Israel is violating international humanitarian law. So... You're making statements, maybe you're only thinking about these statements in the context of foreign policy, but they have a ricochet effect here in the United States. And the anti-Semites at Columbia or at GW or wherever are using those statements as fuel for their fire of anti-Semitism. And you need to be, putting aside the foreign policy dimension of it, you need to be a heck of a lot more careful in what you say about Israel and what it is or is not doing, not only because of Again, its impact on Israel, but also because of the ricochet effect here on American Jews. And what, what was it, the response? Uh, he appreciated the point. He took the point. I didn't really have a question to ask as a follow-up, um, but he heard the point. I thought it was important that he heard the point. And, um, and, and you know, we hope that that'll impact how they talk about things in a variety of ways. And we're going to be following up on that. What was their the message? The, the meaning was uh, the theme was anti-Semitism. A lot, obviously, Israel came up. But what was what was the message from the White House at this meeting on anti-Semitism? What was what was your uh, point uh, argument to 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 find it? Or I guess a lot a lot of officials at that meeting near at hand as well. I believe, right? Uh, yeah. Or, so the meeting was chaired. The meeting was chaired by Doug Amhoff, um, yeah. the second gentleman, uh, the vice president's husband, and also. Neera Tandon, who's the uh, chief domestic policy advisor, and Liz Sherwood Randall, who's the Homeland Security Advisor to the President. And I would say overall the theme from the administration side was um, uh, they, they scheduled this meeting because it it's more or less a year since they rolled out the first ever national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. And this was meant to be a meeting of like, okay, where we are, you know, a year later. Um, of course, when they rolled it out, they did not, anti-Semitism was really bad. But then obviously that was before 10-7 when it's been like supercharged. Um, and there, the administration's basic message was, we've done a lot. Um, and, uh, and, and we think it's important that, you know, we've done a lot, but obviously we need to do more. Um, they didn't try to say they've solved the problem, for sure. Uh, and from our side of the table, I think, again, across a number of organizations across the spectrum of the American Jewish community, the message was, we appreciate that you have done a lot. We appreciate that the president and all of you have clearly said anti-Semitism is unacceptable and we need to fight it. And we need you to do more because the situation has only gotten worse. And, and then it was more about getting into maybe some practical, you know, additional things that the administration can do, and we hope that they will do um, in the current situation. And there's another call that you were also on within the last week that got a lot, also got attention. We also broke the news in, in Jewish Insider about this call, but it was uh, with Secretary of Education Cardona, also near Tandon, the domestic policy advisor at the White House. The call was about anti-Semitism, and it was learned right before this call took place that an anti, at least one, maybe several anti-Israel left-wing groups that sort of reflect uh, views outside the mainstream of the, the Jewish community were also included on the call. Uh, can you tell us what happened uh, and why <laughs> those groups' inclusions were problematic and what exactly the White House said about the Department of, Edu um, the Department of Education uh, in our story for kind of a, a, a miscue, but tell us about, you know, it was this, you know, it's not often that you 
he refused to be on a call with the White House, but apparently there was a real mix-up and, and, and something about that. I, 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 I think, button. yeah, look, I think, um, I think the important thing to say about this was that, um, was that, is that, um, at the end of it, the White House and the Secretary of Education's office was responsive to our concerns, and we had the meeting that we wanted to have. What I mean, in other words, there were a number of us, there are a number of mainstream organizations that had requested an urgent meeting with the Secretary of Education, um, and that meeting was set up, and then um, we learned very shortly, well, we learned the night before that some other groups were being invited to the meeting that we had requested, which was very unusual. Um, and then when we asked who they were, we didn't find out right away. And then, as you say, we found out at the last minute. And um, again, which were the groups that were the main, the main, the mainstream groups that had requested the meeting, which were our, the OU, the ADL, excuse me, uh, the OU, the ADL, um, Jewish Federations of North America, Hillel. Um, the leaders of those organizations uh, decided that you know we couldn't really participate with these other groups that were being parachuted into the meeting, um, so we withdrew from that meeting that was scheduled. But again, they they the to the credit I actually give the credit to um, the White House. Um, they were very responsive, and we literally had our meeting that we were intended to have three hours later. With the Secretary of Education, and we had the conversation that we wanted to have. Just to clarify, the groups that were problematic, who were they, and was this the first time that they'd been invited or you know been, been involved in sort of a communal meeting like like that? Um, there, there, there were there were there were a few that were problematic. The, just the one I would highlight, uh, and I'll explain why they were problematic was was actually a group, frankly, that I hadn't heard of before that moment, which was uh, a group called the Diaspora Alliance, which is somehow, I think, connected. I haven't had the time or I haven't researched it, but it's somehow connected to If Not Now. Um, and part of what we wanted to talk about at the meeting was the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and how the education department should be using that more. And this Diaspora Alliance group is very clearly at odds with that. Um, and again, what was unusual about this situation was that, again, we were the ones requesting the meeting. And I've been to many meetings in which, whether it's the White House or the Education Department or the Justice Department, like if they are calling the meeting, they get to decide, decide who they want to invite to the meeting. And I've been to plenty of meetings at different cabinet agencies and at the White House where there have been groups from the Jewish community with whom the OU disagrees and might disagree on very important issues. But if it's if it's the government entity that's calling the meeting, right, yes, we could decide we're not going to go to a meeting because some group that we disagree with is there. But in general, I would say our approach is one of engagement and also it's important to be there, perhaps to be, you know, a counterpoint if one of those groups raises something and represents that as well, this is the view of the Jewish community, like you can be there to say, well, actually, there's a divergence of opinion in the Jewish community, we think differently. This was a different scenario. This was, we, we had a set of groups that requested a meeting, right? It, it, was, it was almost like no different than, let's just say, I'm just picking randomly, let's say um, a group of environmentalist organizations requested a meeting with the Secretary of the Interior, and then somebody on the staff of the Interior Department decides to put some oil company executives into the meeting with the environmentalists. Um, the environmentalists would say, I don't, wait a second, this is our meeting, we appreciate that you're meeting with us, but like you, you, you can't put those people into our meeting. If you wanna meet with the oil company executives, go ahead, but that's a different meeting. And that was, that was kind of what played out here. And again, we're grateful that it was, it was corrected and we had the meeting that we wanted to have and we're going forward with hopefully more constructive things that the Secretary of Education and others can do for our Jewish students on campuses. How big of it, I hear a lot these days, especially in democratic circles about staff. You see these stories about anonymous junior staffers trying to speak out against the administration's policy or criticize uh, the, the folks who, with whom they work. Um, 
How big of an issue is that? I, I never in my years of covering Washington have ever seen such a dynamic where you have, an, you know, an anonymously especially, you have like these stories being reported of, you know, a few dozen anonymous staffers at different agencies, Capitol Hill, of trying to, of, and often on issues, and this is usually about Israel, they're trying to uh, undermine their own, you know, administration's policies. Well, what do you make of that? And, and what's going on there? Because I, this seems like that may have happened at the, I don't know if that, that's what happened at the education department. You had some staffer making a mistake, but it does seem like you, you hear a lot more about junior staffers or folks that are less influential, but seem to be uh, getting a lot of outsized attention. Yeah, I, look, I don't, I, I, I don't know. There's no way to measure like how big a problem is this. And I think ultimately the most important decisions are being made by the senior people. Um, whether it's in the administration or whether it's on Capitol Hill. Um, um, you know, I do think that um, there is an element to it, I'll just say, that, you know, just as, just as we have this remarkable phenomenon of these campus protests where um, – the protesters, the campers, right, keep their faces covered because they don't want to actually be identified and they don't want to suffer any penalty for what they're doing. And, and there have been a number of people, not just, you know, on the conservative side of the spectrum, so to speak, who've written like, you don't get the whole civil disobedience thing, right? Civil disobedience, right? Martin Luther King and, and so on and so forth. Like, civil disobedience is about I'm willing to take a consequence for standing on my principle, right? I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to have a record. I'm going to do whatever. That shows you how dedicated I am to this cause. Um, and you have these students on campus who are like, no, well, I kind of care about this and I'm going to camp out on the quad, but I really don't want my record to show it. There's kind of so something really uh, questioning there about how committed are they to the cause, perhaps. I think there's a similar, you could ask a similar question about these anonymous government people you know, you choose to serve in an administration. Um, if you don't like the policy administration, you should resign um, and not carry out the policies of the administration. Um, and, and to think you can just sort of go on and uh, be, a, you know, somehow conduct guerrilla warfare against um, the organization, you know, in this case, the government that you're serving, the administration that you're serving is just wrong. Uh, going to a question in the chat box, I'll, I'll kind of summarize it a little bit. It's about how a lot of Muslim organizations have had a campaign or have been outspoken and calling on their voters to abandon Biden, to not, not support Biden because they don't agree that they call for a ceasefire, if not more. Um, and, and they think it has had results. Biden has pandered to, 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 the, to the community, maybe uh, in some, 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 some spaces. Um, the question is like, I think the question is like, what's the balance between working behind the scenes, having these conversations and, uh, you know, saying, you know, drawing red lines and actually, you know, politicking and saying, as the question, questioner says, should the Orthodox Jewish community start a similar campaign to essentially oppose Biden? I don't think that's, that's at all where you are, but what is the balance broadly of trying to work from within the tent and then kind of criticize when necessary? Well, look, let, 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 me, let me come at it. Look, the Orthodox Union um, is a nonpartisan uh, organization where, and, and we actually, by law, are not allowed to endorse candidates. So we're never going to say, vote for or against Joe Biden or vote for or against Donald Trump or anybody else. Um, um, and our role, as we see it, is to, um, is to engage with the government officials who are in positions of authority and responsibility um, and to try to advance the interests and the values of our community. Um, and we do that you know, on different issues. Obviously, the preeminent issue right now is support for Israel and combating anti-Semitism. But, uh, you know, we also work on education issues. We work on religious freedom issues here in the United States and others. And we've worked with different member, you know, different administrations and different members of Congress on different sides of the aisle, depending on what the issue is. Um, and, uh, you know, you can talk about um, boycotting or not engaging with whoever, but, um, you know, there's an amusing saying which is um, uh, uh, that's sometimes used around Washington, which is uh, if you're not if you're not sitting at the table, then you're on the menu. Um, and government is going to do things that will impact our community or impact things that we care about. Um, and the best thing generally that we try to do is engage so we can advance what our community wants to advance. 
Now, there are other people in the community, whether it's individuals or organizations like the Republican Jewish Coalition or like the National Jewish Democratic Organization. Like, there are partisan Jewish organizations, and they will be running campaigns about, you know, Joe Biden and Donald Trump in this election cycle and so on and so forth. That's their job and that's their role. Um, it's not the role of the OU. Right, and I, I'm glad to clarify that. I was, I, I think the, the, the broader question is not, not about partisan politics that you don't, don't engage in, but sort of the, the need to speak up versus the need to kind of do things behind the scenes and have those um, maybe uh, so that's, look, that, there's always Look, there's always a balance on that. Um, obviously, public, uh, public statements or op-eds or other kinds of thought leadership, uh, mobilizing grassroots uh, activity, that's all part of the process too. There, 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 you know, you need you need both. You need to be able to talk to the policymakers. Sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes in closed rooms where hopefully a uh, Jewish insider does not find out about the meeting or does not find out about what's being said. And sometimes you do want to put pressure on them through uh, very public displays. That that all goes together. Those are all parts of the, you know, of an effective strategy. I want to talk about campus anti-Semitism. Obviously, been in the news. Uh, hopefully, dies down a little bit with graduations and yes. the end of the semester coming up. But what, what I, I want to get start big picture, then we'll talk a little bit of the details. But how, how has it come to this, and, and why are we seeing, in your mind, administrators so uh, unable, unwilling to really? I mean, maybe belatedly they were willing, but but it took a long time to really confront what was pretty nakedly anti-Semitic and threatening activity on so many elite campuses. And relatedly, like, what is the policy? Is there a policy? Like, what is the policy solution? I know you've been involved in legislation on anti-Semitism, but what, as far as what's going on now, like, what, what do you think is the best kind of a way to confront? Uh, this? Yeah, I, I feel more comfortable answering the second part of the question than the first. I'm not a sociologist, and I'm not a, uh, you know, uh, scholar of uh, university culture. Um, the one thing I would say, and, and and again, people have written and talked about all kinds of you know causes. Um, one thing I would say, though, is abundantly clear is that, you know, so many of these university presidents, however smart they might be, um, were not prepared and did not have the, the abilities necessary to deal with this situation. Um, and that's just, you know, and I'm not just talking about, like, do they know how to testify before the House Education Committee? They just they just didn't know. Like, uh, they, this is not something probably would typically get asked, you know, in an interview and vetting process for somebody that a university board is thinking about making their president. It will be going forward, I'm sure. Um, in terms of the responses, um, um, you know, th th there are several there are several layers. Um, some of which are about the government, and some of which again are about the university doing something. Like from the government side. You know the lever that the government has. Um, the ultimate, the ultimate lever the government has is all these universities, um, either through grants or through you know to the university or from students coming to their university and using Pell grants or other government subsidies. All these universities get millions and millions and millions of government dollars, um, and the risk, the threat of them losing that money. I don't care how big your endowment is. Um, is a very significant threat. Um, and that threat is tied to the university's legal obligation under the Civil Rights Act, specifically Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, to ensure, in this case, that Jewish students do not suffer discrimination on campus, that Jewish students are not interfered with or in any way harassed in going about enjoying the educational environment you know, that they're entitled to. Um, and so what we've been trying to do in a variety of ways is getting the, the, in this case, the U.S. Department of Education to put more and more pressure, um, and, and, and also provide resources and tools and guidance to university leaders to do more and to do a better job of fulfilling their legal obligation of making sure these environments are, um, safe for Jewish students. That, by the way, does not translate into, right, there can never be any anti-Israel protests on a campus, right? What it translates into is um, there being able to be, so to speak, rules and regulations on a campus so that the students that want to protest can do their protesting 
and give voice to what they want to give voice to, but not in a way that is bullying or harassing or otherwise interfering with the Jewish with the Jewish students on campus. Uh, um, and so um, one of the results from our meeting with Secretary Cardona was that they put out for, as we as we as we had been requesting, the department put out very specific uh, guidance with illustrative examples of you know different scenarios. If these things happen on your campus, you better deal with them. Otherwise, you're going to get investigated and potentially penalized. Um, the department, the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education has opened up investigations into a lot, most of these universities, um, and those investigations will result. It might result in penalties. It might result in them losing their money, or it might result by, in in some kind of agreement, a settlement agreement, in which the university says, "Okay, here are the new procedures and policies we're going to put into place to ensure that Jewish students are safe um, going forward," and that will be an important result as well. Um, I th also would say uh, that uh, one of the one of the missing players in this in this drama. Um, you know, we've been focused a lot, and that's our role at the OU Advocacy Center on the on the federal authorities. Um, I do think state officials could do much more. Um, state superintendents of education also have authority and also have sway over these universities in their individual states, and uh, and they could be doing more to help the Jewish community on campuses in their states. It, it's been really interesting to see these hearings from the House Education Committee. Uh, I mean, it's really put Elise Stefanik in the spotlight, uh, giving her some, you know, what do they call strange new respect in the world of politics. Uh, but it's also moved the needle. Uh, I, I was struck. We were, you know, I think we noted this in Jewish Insider that the day the House Republicans requested a hearing with the D.C. mayor, uh, that was when, after many, many days, the GW encampment got taken down. It was yep. the threat of a hearing that seemed to coincide with action taking place. Uh, so there's policy, like specific legislation. There's also the politics moving the needle as well. Um, I'm curious. You see, you see a lot on the House side. Republicans obviously control the House. Um, Bernie Sanders controls essentially the corresponding uh, education committee in the Senate. Why haven't we seen any activity in the Senate? Do you think we will? And what what's been, in your view, the the, the holdup? Uh, the answer to your question was in your question. Uh, very sadly, Senator Bernie Sanders chairs the relevant committee and obviously has no interest in holding hearings on this. Other senators of both parties have asked him to, most notably um, Senator Jackie Rosen, who's a Democrat, and Senator James Lankford, who's a Republican, and they co-chair the Senate uh, caucus on combating anti-Semitism. They publicly called on Chairman Sanders to hold a hearing, uh, and he just won't. Um, and uh, we've been trying to push to put some pressure on him to do that. Um, but uh, it's really, it's really frankly shameful um, that, uh, that he's held that up. Um, but the House will keep doing their thing um, and, uh, and shine a spotlight on it that way. Um, and, and maybe, you know, uh, uh, there have been some roundtables on the Senate side. Senator, Senator Cassidy from Louisiana is the ranking Republican on that Senate committee, and he's held some round, not formal hearings, he's held some roundtables with Jewish students from campuses and things like that, but that's obviously not the same as holding a proper hearing, which is long overdue in the Senate. What, on the Senate side, I mean, since you kind of were very clear spoken about sort of the holdup and why, why it's taking place. What role, if any, does Senator Schumer, Senate Majority Leader Schumer have in kind of getting that done? Like, does he have any pressure that he could put on? I know you're very close to, to Senator Schumer. Yeah, I mean, a long, long time. yeah, I mean, it, I, I, I think generally over, I mean, in my experience over, over years, I mean, majority leaders, whether in the House or in the Senate, uh, tend to try to not, you know, be too heavy handed with what committee chairmen do in their committee. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a particular message in, in, you know, Schumer pushing or not pushing Sanders to have a hearing that's, you know, there, there are other more impactful things that Senator Schumer can do as majority leader. And the one that we're asking him to do at the moment is to bring the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, which was passed overwhelmingly by the House, 
to the Senate floor for a vote. That he does not actually need to go through committee. I mean, there is a Senate bill, which is sponsored by Tim Scott as a Republican and Bob Casey as a Democrat. But again, uh, if you would be going through regular order, right, it would have to go through the Sanders committee. Sanders is not going to take it up in committee. Um, so the thing to do is to bring the House passed bill to the Senate floor for a vote. Um, and uh, that's something that Senator Schumer could do, whether Senator Sanders likes it or not. You've known Senator Schumer for a, a long time. He uh, has been a friend of the Jewish community. He, you know, if you talk to him long enough, he'll talk about his name. He's a shomer, a protector. Yep. Uh, that's something he cares very much about. I'm curious, just big picture, forget about just this little slice of policy, but broadly speaking, um, how uh, he's, he's led uh, on all these issues. He's dealing with a faction. You mentioned Bernie Sanders, but there are other senators. We've reported a lot about Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, but there are a lot of, uh, well, maybe not a lot, but maybe about a quarter to a fifth of the Senate, uh, more more toward, more critical towards Israel, less um, you know responsive perhaps on these issues we've talked about. How do you think he's handled sort of this, this very diverse, uh, fractious at times caucus on, on these issues? Um, I mean, in terms of that narrow question, I, I, I think I think he's, I think to be fair, I think he's probably handled it as well as he could. Again, the Senate Majority Leader has a lot of power, but does not have, certainly does not have as much power as the Speaker or the Majority Leader in the House does, right? I mean, that, people may not realize this. The House of Representatives is basically a dictatorship. Uh, putting, putting aside the fact that right now you have the narrowest majority for Republicans, I think, ever in history. and that I, really I was going to say, I, wish Mike jo I think Mike Johnson wishes he saying, had some, so but you're this absolutely is, right. Absolutely this right. is a very unusual situation in the House of Representatives where members of the majority in the House of Representatives actually have as much power as senators typically do because just one or two of them can really blow up the whole thing. But typically, the House majority runs like a dictatorship and the leadership decides what's going and it goes. The Senate, where you know you need unanimous consent to get things to happen on the Senate floor, or you need 60 votes to break a filibuster and things like that, is is much more difficult to manage. Um, and and I think, again, I want to be fair. I think Senator Schumer, for example, what he did with the Israel aid, the Israel Ukraine, et cetera, aid package, which by the way we also got. $400 million into for security grants to synagogues and day schools and other American Jewish community institutions, um, he, he managed it in a way that staved off um, a lot of, you know, the kinds of senators that you mentioned, like Van Hollen or Bernie Sanders and others. They wanted to put all kinds of conditions on that aid to Israel in that package, and, and Schumer deserves credit for maneuvering that in a way that kept those conditions out. And in fact, it also included none of the money could go to UNRWA, uh, in terms of humanitarian aid, so so to be fair, you know he he did that um, and he did that well, and that was the bill that ultimately the president signed. Um, but uh, you know he's also uh, he also gave this speech um, whenever it was two months ago at this point maybe, um, which uh, which was quite startling um, for somebody in his position and with his history, and it was very troubling to a lot of people in the pro-Israel community. Um, and, and, and now, um, he's, again, he, he, we're sort of at another moment where, um, we, we, we'd like to see him move this anti-Semitism Awareness Act, um, and do some other things, uh, that would be, that would be helpful and that he does not necessarily need to, um, you know, uh, allow the, the far left senators who are anti-Israel to derail. Speaking of the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, there have been obviously the reticence on the left. There's also been reticence on the right uh, who have argued that, <laughs> including from some, you know, not just the right, but some pretty prominent. What's on the right? Centers. What's on the right is a little bit more comical than reticence. Marjorie well, Taylor Greene. Well, well, I guess when Marjorie I say the right, Taylor I, I, announced that it's good. It will outlaw Christianity. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm not just talking about the Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Tucker Carlson, right? That that far right, you know, David French in the New York Times, right? And uh, a lot of centrist-minded, uh, center-right, uh, you know, the free press, uh, Barry Weiss's publisher, ran a couple editorials full of the legislation because it, they thought it may infringe on free speech grounds. 
can you kind of address concerns that that's something that I know, um, you know, I think the opposition is more, at least in the votes, more concentrated on the left, but that's certainly among a lot of top conservative thinkers and, and opinion leaders have raised the, the free speech concerns with the anti-Semitism awareness act. What, what, what's your response to that? Yeah. Well, uh, the, fir- the, the first response is it's not a crim- it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's not a piece of uh, legislation that puts anything in criminal law, right? There's no, this is, um, it's not going to outlaw anything, so to speak. Um, what the AAA does do is uh, is codify, frankly, the policy that uh, the Department of Education is already utilizing um, based on an executive order that Donald Trump signed, which was based on a policy that President Obama had, which is to use the IHRA definition and its illustrations, its, its examples, as how they uh, assess and investigate whether something going on is anti-Semitic. Um, and those examples include examples of when anti-Israel language or anti-Zionist language and things like that are basically being used as a masquerade for what's really anti-Semitic. Basically what we've seen play out in vivid, you know, technicolor for the past months um, you know, is, is, is what the IHRA definition is about. It doesn't inherently stop anybody from expressing a point of view, uh, number one. Um, and um, you would need to show in an investigation or whatever it is that the education department is doing that there's some evidence um, or, or there's a connection between what the protesters or the speakers are doing that, that, that shows you that it's, that it's in fact, you know, anti-Semitism in disguise, so to speak. Um, so there's the, 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 the First Amendment argument, and, and by the way, ultimately, uh, the way things work in this country, um, if, you, if you know your schoolhouse rock, is uh, the Constitution is superior to a statute. So if it really is unconstitutional, if we get it passed, I'm sure the ACLU or somebody else is going to bring a lawsuit um, and if it is indeed unconstitutional, if it violates the First Amendment, it will be struck down as unconstitutional. Um, and that will be the ultimate lit- litmus test for that question. But, but um, those, those, those arguments really don't hold water. Wrapping things up here on Inside the Newsroom with Nathan Diamond. We've run the, the gamut. Uh, I wanted to kind of, in the end, I don't know if it's good news, but I think maybe encouraging news. Uh, we, uh, I certainly talked to you at Jewish Insider about the status of something called NSGP, the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. It may sound like an acronym, but it's, it's very important when it comes to protecting uh, Jewish institutions, synagogues, community centers, you, you name it. Um, there were some developments uh, legislatively on, on, on that front. I know it sounded like there was a setback uh, earlier this year, but can you, you, you alluded to it a little earlier, but I wanted to kind of give you the chance to give our audience an update on, on where things stand, where what, what the status of the security grants uh, for this fiscal yeah, year. sure. And, and again, it's 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 unfortunate. You know, we uh, the OU is one of the organizations that spearheaded the creation of this program more than 15 years ago, when we saw that synagogues and day schools and other Jewish community institutions were actually in the wake of 9/11, starting to get more and more concerned about terrorist threats and needed to upgrade their security, and um, and the cost of security is just tremendous. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the world has Back, back when we started this program, it was a twenty-five million dollar program, and it's 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 really unfortunate that the the way anti-Semitism has grown and the way the world has developed in the past decade and a half, um, you know, it's now it's now such a dramatically more uh, expensive, so to speak, program. Um, to last year, um, Congress allocated three hundred and fifteen million dollars to the program. And then this year, um, we started asking in the wake of October 7th for a dramatic uh, infusion of funds to it uh, because of all the increased security costs. Um, In the regular appropriation cycle for this year, um, the the funding for the program was actually cut a little bit, not because anybody was targeting this program, but just because they were cutting all kinds of things across the board. And so... um, we got about $275 million for the program in the regular appropriations bill for Homeland Security, but we knew we would still have another opportunity in the, in the supplemental package, which had the Israel aid and the Ukraine aid and, and the other things in it. 
and we, we, we worked with our partners to get $400 million uh, in that package. So in total for this year, we basically doubled, more than doubled the program to $675 million. The applications, uh, for those of you who are involved uh, in, in your synagogue or your institution, the applications for that first round of grants are actually open right now um, and are due pretty soon uh, for that first $275 million. Um, and then there's going to be another grant cycle, which we're still talking to DHS about how that's going to work. Um, but probably within the next two or three months, there'll be another grant cycle rolled out for the other $400 million. So stay tuned. It sounds like the good news and that, that the, the funds are on the way, right? It's, yeah. yeah. Well, Nathan, we're, we're almost at that, that uh, hour point, but... Uh, we had, I think we only touched the surface of some of these very, very important issues that you're dealing with on, on a regular basis, a daily basis. But thank you so much for coming on. We'll, 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 you will see Nathan in the pages of Jewish Insider <laughs> um, offering analysis and perspective. But we look forward to talking to you in the future and hopefully to have you back here on another episode of Inside the Newsroom. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you, Josh. And uh, Jewish Insider does, does great work. Uh, breaking stories and, and keeping all of its readers informed and, uh, and, and it's a very valuable resource for the Jewish community and for the political community in general. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Nathan. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll see you next week here on Inside the Newsroom. Take care.